We're so honored today uh, to have Dr. Kent Brantley with us today. Uh, Dr. Brantley is a family medicine physician who served as a medical missionary at LOL Hospital in Monrovia, Liberia from October 2013 to July 2014. Dr. Brantley received his medical degree from Indiana University School of Medicine and has finished his family medicine residency and fellowship at Maternal Child Health uh, at John Peter Smith Hospital in Fort Worth, Texas. And prior to entering uh, medical school, he received a Bachelor in Arts and Biblical Text from Abilene Christian University in Abilene, Texas. <clears throat> While serving as a family physician at Elwha Hospital in Liberia in the spring of 2014, Dr. Brantley found himself fighting on the front lines of the battle against the deadliest Ebola outbreak ever to occur. In July, Samaritan's Purse <clears throat> took over responsibility and clinical care for Ebola patients um, in Liberia. And Dr. Brantley was appointed as the medical director for what would become the only Ebola treatment uh, unit in all of southern Liberia. On July 26, last year, he was diagnosed with Ebola virus disease. Dr. Brantley became the first person in the world to receive the experimental drug ZMAP and the first person with Ebola to be treated in the United States where he was evacuated to Emory University Hospital. He now feels it's his privilege and duty to speak on behalf of the people of West Africa who continue to suffer from the scourge of Ebola. Dr. Brantley uh, works with Samaritan's Purse and holds the position of Medical Missions Advisor for Samaritan's Purse. He and his wife, Amber, along with their ch two children, are based out of Texas. And the Brantleys are authors of a newly released book um, called Called for Light. So I encourage you, if you get a chance to read this book, uh, it will bless you. Um, and it is out now. <clears throat> Dr. Brantley is here today to speak with us um, on viral hemorrhagic fever. So without further ado, Dr. Brantley, if you would go ahead and start your presentation. Thank you, Beth. Good afternoon. I would like to start this session uh, with just with a, a brief word of prayer before we get into the talk. So if you would, pray with me. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that your mercy is new every morning, that your faithfulness is, is enduring, that your love is steadfast. Father, as we begin this conversation discussing the topic of viral hemorrhagic fevers, Lord, I, I pray that you would bless the academic part of this discussion, that you would also touch hearts and minds to the, the inequalities that exist in this world, that you would move people as disciples of Jesus to, to go about serving those in the greatest of need. So Father, I pray you would bless our time this afternoon and and that your name would be glorified in, in what is discussed here. And we thank you for this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. The uh, topic for today is viral hemorrhagic fevers. I want to start by telling you I am a family physician. I'm not an infectious disease specialist. I am not a laboratory scientist or virologist, but what gives me any voice in the conversation on viral hemorrhagic fevers is that I am this guy, if you're seeing the slideshow, right there. In, in 2014, I was serving with the post-residency program, part of World Medical Mission, the medical mission arm of Samaritan's Purse, and I was serving as a family physician at Elwa Hospital in Liberia when what has now become the world's worst Ebola outbreak in history came to our front door. And we chose at that time to stay and respond to this outbreak, to to create an isolation unit and to begin treating patients. And we did this um, because we thought it was necessary. 
when when a disaster comes to where you are, you can choose to to flee or to stay and respond. And our purpose for going to Liberia was to serve people in great need. And the the onset of this Ebola outbreak only magnified our purpose for being there. And as as you know, I ended up contracting Ebola and being brought back to America for treatment at Emory University Hospital where I was the first American uh, treated for Ebola in the United States. So I want to start our our conversation today with a case study. This is a real case of a patient that I took care of in June of 2014, the end of May, beginning of June. I did have to recreate a few of the details from memory so uh, it's not it's not a chart review but it's accurate to the presentation of this patient. I was working in the emergency room I was on call for the weekend and on Saturday evening late afternoon early evening a 34 year old man presented with one week of stomach pain and fever. As we gathered more history on this patient he said he had had worsening stomach pain over the past week it had a decrease in his appetite and he had experienced fever throughout the week that was persistent. He did not specify any certain part of his abdomen that hurt. It was generalized abdominal pain. A review of his symptoms and a review of his other systems showed no vomiting or diarrhea. He had not been around anyone who was sick that he knew of. When I asked about travel history you have to keep in mind this is this is the beginning of the Ebola outbreak. We had not seen any cases in Monrovia, but there were cases known in in Guinea and Sierra Leone. So I asked this man about his travel history, and he said, "I've only been to Buchanan. Now, Buchanan is southeast of Monrovia, which is the opposite direction from any known cases of Ebola. He was in Buchanan working as a carpenter." And he, he said he had never had an illness like this. And, and that's about as much information as we were able to gather. On physical exam, we have a febrile patient who's tachycardic, mildly hypotensive. And this respiratory rate is, is his actual respiratory rate. He's really breathing 18 times a minute, which is different than a respiratory rate of 20 that you might see in a hospital where you're not sure if they really count it or not. This, this man was mildly tachypnic. He was, he was a well-developed, thin, muscular man. He, he looked like a strong, fit guy who swings a hammer uh, for several hours every day. But he was diaphoretic laying in the emergency room and was, appeared to be mildly distressed. He was mentally coherent. He could answer my questions as, as much as I was able to communicate with him cross-culturally and across the, the language barrier between my American English and his Liberian English. His, his head and neck exam was notable for conjunctival injection in both eyes, but otherwise unremarkable. No lymphadenopathy. His ears were, were normal. His throat looked normal, no, no erythema or discharge in his throat. He was mildly tachycardic, but his heart rhythm sounded normal. His lungs were clear, no crackles, no rowels. And on abdominal exam, he had a generalized tenderness. There was no focal tenderness, no rebound, but he did have slight guarding to palpation. And although he was clammy and, and diaphoretic, his capillary refill was still less than three seconds. So we ordered laboratory tests on this patient. Now I want to explain the labs that you're seeing in front of you right now. A hemoglobin of 11.4. Now for a 34-year-old, otherwise healthy man, uh, that's pretty anemic. But in the setting of an emergency room in Liberia where people battle malaria, 
repeatedly throughout their lifetimes. Uh, a hemoglobin of 11.4 in an otherwise healthy man is not really that concerning. Maybe a little lower than normal, but uh, it doesn't grab your attention too much. His HIV test was negative. MS, that stands for malaria smear. So a lab technician put a smear of the man's blood on a slide and, and visually scanned it for parasites and did not see any malaria parasites in the blood smear. And the urinalysis is a dipstick. It shows positive white blood cells, positive nitrites, positive leukocyte esterase, and positive bacteria. Now you may be saying, well, what about his renal function? What about his liver function? What about a white blood cell count or a differential? And those things would be really nice. But you're in an emergency room in Liberia. And so what you see in front of you is what you get. You might want to order a chemistry panel, but sorry, it's Saturday evening. The laboratory is probably warmed up ambient temperature wise so that the chemistry machine is not working at this point. Either that or we ran out of the cartridges for the chemistry panel test. So you go back to your clinical assessment and the history just like you learn in medical school history and, and physical exam to try to determine what is wrong with this patient. And you do your best to come up with a differential diagnosis. I, I think I forgot to mention, I'm going to back up here, on physical exam I skipped the um, part of his exam that said he had bilateral costovertebral angle tenderness. Uh, just lightly tapping on his back did elicit significant pain uh, on, on both sides. So we jump to the differential diagnosis my first thought is this patient could have pyelonephritis with sepsis. He's been sick for a week. His urine, um, I failed to mention, that urine specimen is a catheter specimen and we got a very small amount of urine on his catheter specimen. Uh, but he had a dirty urine dipstick. He has abdominal pain and fever with CVA tenderness. So top of my differential diagnosis is pyelonephritis with sepsis. He meets SIRS criteria with his tachycardia, tachypnea, and fever. And uh, you always have to consider that this could be malaria. In spite of the negative malaria smear, you have to acknowledge that that, that test is, is user dependent. It, it requires the lab technician to do the test correctly and accurately and there could be an error in that and so you have to consider even with a negative malaria smear he could have severe malaria. Typhoid fever is very common in Liberia and there is not a good test to rule it in or rule it out. We did have a, a test that we could order but I rarely ordered it because it was not helpful in ruling in or ruling out typhoid fever and one of the biggest complications that we would see from typhoid is a bowel perforation which could be consistent with this, pic this patient's picture of a week of fever and worsening abdominal pain now with generalized guarding and, and non-focal symptoms. But he could also have a different kind of perforation. He could have a rupture of his appendix. He could have appendicitis. No normal things like appendicitis do happen in exotic places like Liberia. Another common cause that we saw of generalized abdominal pain is peptic ulcer disease. And you may say, well, but he has a fever. It's true. And not all of these things really explain the whole picture. Uh, so, so you ask, could it be something else? Is there, is there some other diagnosis that you might want to add to your differential? But for starters, given the, the treatment options we have available. Um, this was the, the differential list to start with. So with this differential diagnosis and the treatment modalities available to us, we started this patient on IV fluids, aggressive IV rehydration because of his 
his tachycardia, his mild hypotension, and um, his his lack of urine output. So aggressive IV fluids and broad spectrum antibiotics, which in our hospital meant ceftriaxone. We began this patient on that treatment, and and I went about my duties as the doctor on call for the whole hospital for the weekend. When I came back to reevaluate this patient a couple hours later, his symptoms had changed slightly. I noticed he was developing a facial twitch. The muscles in his face were twitching. He was occasionally having twitching of his hands or, or arms or legs. And with pyelonephritis, with sepsis being on the top of my differential, I considered could he have renal failure. I checked a potassium. Turns out the lab was able to run a potassium for us even though it was Saturday evening. And his potassium came back very high, 6.1. That is a critical level. So now my differential narrows a little bit. Something's causing renal failure in this patient. So could it be that he that my first diagnosis was correct? He has pyelonephritis with sepsis now with renal failure. Despite aggressive fluid rehydration, he still has not made any more urine. So how do we treat his hyperkalemia? Well, the only treatment options really available to us in the hospital included giving him glucose and insulin to drive the potassium into the cells and lower his, his circulating potassium level. We checked the glucose, it was normal, and we administered glucose and potassium, or I'm sorry, glucose and insulin to try to bring down his potassium level. But in the back of your mind, you're saying, could this be something different? As I reevaluated the patient, again, on an ongoing basis, I noticed that his twitching turned into almost convulsions. He began clenching his jaw, twitching his shoulders and his legs, and the only treatment we had available besides trying to lower his potassium was intramuscular Valium to try to help ease his anxiety, calm him down, maybe help with the with the jerking. I didn't think he was having seizures, but the, the Valium was our our best attempt at creating some comfort for this patient. So we received over a time span multiple doses of IM Valium, intramuscular Valium. As I reevaluated this patient throughout the night and into the following morning, uh, his condition was deteriorating and, and his, his outcome looked very bleak. And I wondered, could this be something different? And in the morning, he began oozing blood from the sites of those IM injections and from his mouth where he was clenching his jaw. We repeated his potassium, it was still elevated. We repeated his dosing of glucose and insulin. And then another patient entered the emergency room. It was a, a young pregnant woman, near term, who had eclampsia. And for those of you listening to this in America, you may say, oh, did he mean preeclampsia? No, I meant eclampsia. She was post-ictal, had just stopped seizing before her husband brought her into the emergency room. And she was bleeding. And a quick bedside ultrasound showed a placenta previa and a breech baby that was near term and still alive. So as we prepped the operating room for an emergency C-section in this patient with a bleeding placenta previa, I began talking with our general surgeon who I called in to assist me on what looked like it could become a very complicated cesarean delivery. And I was talking to her about the patient in the emergency room, case number one that we've been discussing. And I said, I'm, I'm worried that something is not right with this patient. 
Could sepsis cause bleeding? Yes. Severe sepsis can cause bleeding. Can pyelonephritis cause renal failure? Yes. Ad advanced pyelonephritis untreated for a week with an aggressive bug of some sort? Why couldn't he have renal failure? But something didn't seem right. And I said to Dr. Debbie, do you think it might be possible this guy could have Ebola? And her answer was, well, let's treat him like he does until, we're, until we know. So as the OR crew was prepping for the cesarean delivery, we went back to the emergency room and we partitioned off the patient's bed. He was in the corner of the emergency room. We put partitions around his bed. We instructed the nurses. It, it, was, it was clear at this point that we had exhausted our resources, our capacity to treat this patient. And he was nearing the end of his life. We had no other interventions to save his life. So we instructed the nurses, do not touch him. Don't let anyone go near him. Don't use the back door of the ER near his bed. Don't let anyone go there. They have to go around and come in and out the front door. And we, we went to the operating room to do the cesarean delivery. Fortunately, the, the C-section went smoothly. Mom and baby came out fine. And we finished up the C-section and were notified by a nurse that our patient in the emergency room had passed away. This was not a case of Ebola virus. It took us a few days to find out the diagnosis, but this young 34-year-old man actually died of Lassa fever. So when we talk about viral hemorrhagic fevers, right now, if you ask anybody uh, about viral hemorrhagic fever, they're going to they're going to think about Ebola immediately. But there are actually a number of causes of viral hemorrhagic fevers. There are a number of families of viruses that can cause hemorrhagic fevers. The arena, Lassa virus is actually an arena virus. The host or the, the reservoir for arena viruses are rodents. Lassa fever virus can be found in mouse droppings, mouse urine. Bunya viruses, like the Hunta virus, which is actually present in the United States, or the Rift Valley fever virus, uh, those are carried by arthropods and rodents. And then you have the, the phyloviruses, Ebola and Marburg are the, the main members of that family. And it's believed that their natural reservoir is a fruit bat. That's, that's been investigated quite a bit over the last year and, and seems to be, in the past it was always a question. We don't know where it is, but we think maybe it's bats. Now there seems to be some more certainty that uh, Ebola virus, at least, is at home in its natural reservoir in the fruit bat population. Other viruses that cause hemorrhagic fever, yellow fever, dengue fever, West Nile virus, which is present in the United States, which are all flaviviruses, uh, which are carried by insects, most notably mosquitoes. And then the paramyxoviruses, which unless you go digging for causes of viral hemorrhagic fever, you probably never heard of Hendra virus or Nipah virus, but they can cause hemorrhagic fever. So at Elwa Hospital, Ebola came to our door. The patient with loss of fever at the, the end of May, beginning of June, kind of reset our level of alert. We had already been preparing for Ebola since the end of March when we first learned about the outbreak, but uh, that case highlighted for us how easy it would be for us to miss a patient with Ebola, and that could be deadly, not only for the patient, but for the healthcare workers in our hospital. And Samaritan's Purse began partnering with SIM, the mission organization that runs Elwa Hospital, and began stocking the, the necessary personal protective equipment. We had already set up our isolation unit in the hospital chapel, and it was only a week later after the diagnosis of our patient with Lassa fever that we got a call from the Ministry of Health 
that they wanted to send us a patient with Ebola virus. So let's talk about Ebola virus. The, the rest of the time in our discussion is going to be focused on this, this cause of viral hemorrhagic fever, Ebola virus, uh, which was discovered in 1976. Who knows how long it's actually been around? There's evidence that maybe it's been around for thousands of years, but it was first discovered in 1976 during an outbreak of a hemorrhagic fever in Zaire and it was named after the nearby river, the Ebola River in Zaire, uh, in the place where that outbreak occurred in 1976. Until 2013, the largest previous outbreak of Ebola occurred in Uganda. There were, in 2001, there were 425 cases, 224 deaths, and that was, that was a big deal. Lots of, lots of Ebola outbreaks between 1976 and 2001, uh, we saw much smaller numbers. The, case, the outbreaks usually occurred in rural villages. They were more easily isolated and contacts were fewer and easier to trace and the, the case numbers therefore were less. What we've seen in this current outbreak is almost 28,000 cases and 11,300 deaths. That includes over 500 healthcare workers who have died from Ebola virus infections that most of them contracted from their patients for whom they were caring. Put those numbers into perspective. Look, look at the numbers from 2001 compared to the numbers of the current outbreak. 425 versus 28,000. And really it was, it was a perfect storm of factors that led to the magnitude of this current outbreak. And I keep saying current outbreak because it's not over. That's a really important take home point for you today is that the outbreak in West Africa is not over. We've seen some really encouraging news recently with dramatic decreases in case numbers. In fact, the, the most recent case numbers from WHO say that and the week ending on August 2nd, there were only two cases diagnosed, one in Sierra Leone and one in Guinea. And that is, that's awesome. We praise God for that. But until there are zero cases for at least 42 days, the outbreak's not over. And we need to not forget about it, not forget about our neighbors. We begin treating patients in... Elwa um, in our chapel and at first it was just one or two patients at a time. We had uh, the first patient on June 11th and then after she passed away a couple of days later we got our second patient, a couple of days later our third patient. The out outbreak in our area began slowly but it, uh, it began gaining speed in late June, early July, and in mid-July it really accelerated rapidly, kind of exponentially. E Ebola virus, as I mentioned, the reservoir is believed to be fruit bats. Um, before this outbreak, no one knew that Ebola existed in West Africa. It had always been isolated to central or East Africa, maybe into the, the Western Central African countries like Gabon, but never far West Africa, Liberia, Guinea, Sierra Leone area. It turns out that there was actually evidence in, in some retrospective research that some patients who died in previous outbreaks of loss of fever in West Africa who tested negative for loss of fever, retrospective analysis of those specimens showed that a very small percentage of those people actually died from Ebola virus. So maybe it's been present in West Africa for a long time and, and no one knew it. The main mode of transmission from human, of human to human transmission is direct contact with the bodily fluids of a sick individual. 
So the, the virus enters the human population through contact with the reservoir. The human eats a bat or has contact with bat droppings, but then the outbreak um, begins when that sick individual who had contact with the reservoir spreads the disease through direct contact with other humans and we begin to see human to human transmission. There's been a question of, of airborne transmission of Ebola. It's been a big topic over the last year as we've looked at the, the spread of this outbreak wondering, people have been wondering could, could we be seeing some other mode of transmission? Could Ebola actually be airborne? And the, the answer is probably, but not predominantly. So we see airborne transmission as, as a possibility when you look at, when, when you ask is something airborne, really that's saying how small can the droplets be that transmit that virus. If, they're, if it's only transmitted in large droplets, then we say it's not airborne because those droplets fall prey to gravity and they, they do not float across a room um, to, to be considered airborne transmission greater than six feet away from the person with the infection. But if they can be carried in small droplets that can be carried on air currents across a room, then they can be inhaled by someone else and we'd say, oh, that could be airborne transmission. The truth is Ebola can probably be spread by the airborne route, but that's not the major mode of transmission. And in dealing with an outbreak and trying to put an end to the human-to-human -human transmission, the best use of resources and the easiest target is the major mode of transmission, which is direct contact with bodily fluids of a sick individual. If I can put the slide back up for just a minute, the incubation period, 2 to 21 days, I want to hop on this soapbox for just a minute. The incubation period is 2 to 21 days. That means from the time a person is exposed to the virus and infected to the time they develop symptoms can range from 2 to 21 days. That's all that 2 to 21 days means. Is this is not a 21 day infection. A person is not contagious for 21 days after they get sick. A, the virus does not live for 21 days on a dead body or in bodily fluids. And there has been a lot of misinformation in the media around this idea of 21 days. It's just the upper limits of the normal incubation period the time, from the time a person is exposed and infected to the time they develop symptoms. And on average, that, that actually occurs between 7 to 10 days most frequently, but it can happen up to 21 days after exposure. So that's the, the, my, my soapbox on 21 days. Next we're going to talk about treatment of Ebola virus. This is a picture that uh, Dr. Lance Plyler took with his cell phone through my bedroom window um, on the night that I received that experimental drug ZMAP for treatment of my Ebola virus disease. Sorry Dr. Plyler can't be with us today. I was really looking forward to uh, having this, hosting this webinar with him, but Beth's doing a great job filling in for him and hopefully he'll get to watch it later some, somehow. So the treatment for Ebola virus disease, the foundation of treatment for Ebola virus disease is supportive care. Let me repeat that again. The foundation of treatment for Ebola virus disease is supportive care. And in the setting of Africa, where Ebola has always occurred in the past, supportive care means, number one, strict contact precautions to protect the health care providers who are, who are caring for the patient with Ebola virus disease. It means IV fluid resuscitation. Patients with Ebola, although the bleeding symptoms are the, the most dramatic and most notorious symptoms of this disease, 
I, I think most people who die of Ebola actually die from dehydration and septic shock, not from exsanguination. So IV fluids are critical in preventing dehydration. Electrolyte supplementation. Now this is one that we're learning a lot about in this outbreak as we've had patients treated in places like Emory University Hospital in Nebraska, in, in places in the West where the electrolytes can be measured and we can see the, the electrolyte imbalances that are part of this disease, notably hypokalemia, uh, also seeing a lot of hypoalbuminemia. And then presumptive and empiric treatment. And the reason I have a question mark by this one is because I think the role of empiric treatment for malaria and other infections is going to change as, the, as we learn more about Ebola. In the past, guidelines have said that anyone being treated for Ebola needs to, be, needs to receive empiric treatment for malaria as well because the symptoms can be so similar and primarily because in the places where people have always been treated for Ebola it has not been possible to test them for any other infections. All testing on Ebola blood has to be done in a biosafety lab level 4 condition and that's just not available in many places in East or Central Africa or West Africa. And those, those laboratory facilities that are available during the middle of an outbreak are overwhelmed testing for Ebola virus and they don't have the capacity to run other tests on every patient with Ebola. So the, the guidelines have said to treat patients empirically for malaria as well as with broad spectrum antibiotics to cover for for other possible infections or for secondary infections that might result as a as, as might come as a result of the Ebola infection. So treating patients for pneumonia or UTIs or 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 any other kind of infection they might get later on while their immune system is is down because of Ebola virus. Other other modalities that are on the front lines for treatment of Ebola virus, there have been there's been a lot of talk in the headlines lately about vaccines. There have been some really good preliminary results on some of the vaccines that are in trial in West Africa. But I want to emphasize that these are preliminary results, and these studies are being done in the setting of a an outbreak with diminishing case numbers. So the data is, is not that strong. It's encouraging data to say that these vaccines might protect people from Ebola virus infection, and that would be a, a game changer in addressing Ebola in the future, and maybe even in helping bring an end to this outbreak. But uh, none of those are, are proven effective and, and available for wide distribution at this point. And then there are other novel approaches to treatment. There are antibodies, like the ZMAP that I received, uh, antibodies targeted at specific proteins expressed on cell surfaces by Ebola virus. There are siRNAs, short interrupt interrupting RNAs that interrupt the nucleic acid replication of the virus. And then people have been trying other antiviral medications to see if they might be effective against Ebola virus. And some of those have shown promising uh, preliminary results. But again, there's, there are no FDA-approved effective medications or treatments against Ebola virus. The foundation of care is supportive care. And, and that brings us to another question uh, about supportive care. And that, that is, what about mechanical ventilation? and hemodialysis because in America when we talk about supportive care for a patient those modalities of treatment are included in supportive care but in most places where Ebola has existed in the past those treatment modalities are not available and we've seen some patients in the United States now treated successfully 
with mechanical ventilation and hemodialysis who have recovered from Ebola virus disease and, and gone on to, to return to health. I think the important, the, the important point is that supportive care plays a role in sustaining the patient long enough for their own immune system to uh, mount a response against the virus. And that's really the role that, that our supportive care plays. And um, we pray that, that we'd find an effective treatment or cure and, a, and an effective vaccine, but for now, we're stuck with supportive care. This is a picture of the team that helped take care of me, some of the team members. This is my house in Liberia. You can see the window to the right side with the blue curtain. That's my bedroom window where I was treated for 10 days before my evacuation to the United States. And this is after my evacuation. They have put the, the red caution tape across the door. And after they, this is right after they finished cleaning up um, all of the the ambulance, the back of the ambulance that carried me to the airport, they had to destroy the contents of the back of that pickup truck. And this is the crew that had just finished that work, and they circled up to pray for me and for Nancy, uh, who was who was also shortly to be evacuated. So this brings us to the end of the PowerPoint slides. The, the take-home points really for this discussion on Ebola virus is that Ebola, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa is not over. Until there are zero cases in the entire region for 42 days, the outbreak is not over. And the best way to combat this outbreak is to put an end to the virus in West Africa. And, and that requires allowing compassion to trump our sense of fear uh, as, as we partner, as we, the international community, partner with our West African neighbors to come to their aid, to assist them in their local responses, and to remember that we are all neighbors. Remember why you chose a career in medicine. Most of you, if you're, if you're in medical school and you're listening to this talk, I want to encourage you to find the application essays you wrote for medical school and hang on to them and read them periodically to remind yourself of why you wanted to become a doctor or a nurse. Because if you don't remind yourself of those motivations, those reasons for going into medicine, to, to care for people in need, to have compassion on the sick, to, to make a difference in the world, if you don't remind yourself of those motivations and reasons frequently, by the time you get to the end of your long road of medical education, four years of medical school, three or four or five or six years of residency, you're, you're going to be a long way from where you started. So I, I want to encourage all of you, whether you're at the beginning of your career or nearing the end of it, remember why you went into a career in medicine in the first place and let that sense of compassion drive the way you treat people every day, no matter where you are. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Brantley, for this great presentation. We're so thankful to hear from you today as someone who uh, has not only treated uh, patients with Ebola, but also been a patient yourself. You certainly understand uh, the disease well. And uh, thank you for your time today and, and sharing with us. Um, we want to open it up for questions. We have a few minutes here. If you would like to ask Dr. Brantley a question, if you would type that in the chat box right now, or you can um, go on Twitter and do hashtag SPIHF and type in your question for us or your comment. Uh, we have a, just a few minutes to answer some questions. Um, 
one thing that um, I just wanted to ask you, Dr. Brantley, uh, myself, is how how was your family in going into um, a, a country? Obviously, when you you started out, the outbreak hadn't come yet. Um, was there a lot of fear with your family uh, treating patients with Ebola when that came about even before you got it? How how was that process for you? We dealt with fear when we heard about the Ebola outbreak. We Amber and I sat down and discussed, okay, wh what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. But as I alluded to in the in my talk, our purpose for m going to Liberia was to serve people in great need. Mm -hmm. And Ebola really highlighted that need. It didn't it didn't take away our purpose for being there. It it increased our sense of purpose, I think. Mm -hmm. And we did everything we could to educate ourselves in the hospital on Ebola and its transmission and the treatment and the, the protocols. We learned those those treatment protocols and the, the PPE protocols frontwards and backwards. And um, there were there were times especially early on before we actually started treating patients when the outbreak was was looming over us but we weren't seeing it yet mm -hmm. there were times that I wondered can I go home today did I miss something did I see a person with Ebola and miss it mm -hmm. um, but ultimately we knew our purpose for being there and and that purpose was greater than our fear of the unknown Oh, that's, that's amazing. That's great. But God gives you the, the grace and, and really a, a family calling, not just yourself, but your, your whole family to go to Liberia and for you to work in conditions like that. Uh, we have a few questions that people are, are asking us. Um, one thing, uh, uh, one of the questions is um, uh, talking about loss of fever specifically, and um, is loss of fever common? Can you speak to that? And, Loss of, yes, loss of fever is actually very common. Um, it's been a while since I looked at these numbers, so I, I may have my numbers off a little bit, but there are something like 250 to 500,000 cases of loss of fever in West Africa annually. The thing about loss of fever, though, is that 85% of those cases are mild to, to our, our subclinical to mild cases of fever, a febrile illness. It's only about 15% of the cases that require medical treatment, that require admission to a hospital. But of those who become severe enough to require treatment in a healthcare facility, the mortality rate is somewhere around 50%. So loss of fever is very common but most people who get it either don't know it or just have a very mild illness. Uh, patients like ours in case number one have a high mortality rate. There is a drug that has been used for treatment of loss of fever uh, and I'm sorry I'm, I'm blanking on the name of it right now but there's a, an antiviral medication uh, that is approved for treatment of loss of fever but it's not effective against Ebola. Um, another question we have for you, Dr. Brantley, is uh, a little bit about post-Ebola syndrome. Can you speak to that a little bit? There are. We've never had a cohort of survivors as large as the group of survivors in West Africa from this outbreak. There's somewhere between 13,000 and 16,000 survivors in West Africa, and we had the experts had learned that people who survive Ebola, there are a few problems that seem to be common among those individuals. Uveitis, some arthritis, but we're learning a lot with this new big cohort of survivors that, and there are research studies going on right now to elucidate what is this post-Ebola syndrome because there really seems to be a syndrome of a, a, a spectrum of symptoms that patients who survive Ebola have. They're not universal. Not everyone has the same symptoms. Not everyone has any symptoms. But we're seeing a lot of survivors 
with uveitis and eye problems, some of them even resulting in blindness. We're seeing arthritis and arthropathies, nerve pain, ongoing neuropathies and neuralgia, um, and and some other some other problems, if fatigue and and mental health issues. I don't think it's specific to Ebola, but if you have been if you spent three weeks of your life in an Ebola treatment unit watching people around you, you can imagine that someone in that situation might have post-traumatic stress disorder mm -hmm. or anxiety or depression um, or someone who's lived through the Ebola outbreak and lost family members and they survived. They may deal with those same kind of issues of anxiety and depression. So post-Ebola syndrome is a real problem and we're learning a lot about it from survivors in West Africa and the survivors in America and uh, I think we're we don't know what causes all of those problems yet we don't know if it's an, a direct effect of the virus if it's an effect of the immune systems response to the virus if maybe there are immune complex mediated problems um, I, I think we have a lot to learn still about it mm -hmm. yeah very good uh, we have another uh, question Dr. Brantley if you could share on the thought you spoke about at Global Missions Health Conference about dying to self and entering the field. Hmm. David Stevens, the president and CEO of the Christian Medical and Dental Association, I've heard him give a talk a few times where he says, you don't have to worry about dying when you go to the mission field if you've already died to yourself once. I, I think that's true, not just of going to the mission field. I think that is our calling as disciples of Jesus is to die to self. He says, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. And that, that changes your perspective and your approach to pretty much everything in life, especially to suffering and uh, tragedy. And uh, that's... a that's something you have to come to grips with on an ongoing daily basis for sure. Um, you know, I look around at some of my friends who are suffering greatly right now and uh, it's not easy to remember that it's okay because we've, we've already died to ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we have another um, and that would love to know uh, if you plan to go back to West Africa and work in the future and how do you help your kids uh, deal with fear? We were very fortunate to be able to go back to Liberia in June of this year to visit our friends and colleagues and co-workers there to, to thank the people who took care of me. Uh, even got a chance to meet and thank the president and vice president of Liberia for the role that they played in, in allowing my evacuation to happen and all of that. Um, that was a really meaningful reunion for us. And, and ultimately we'd like to return to that kind of work. You know, we, we joined the post-residency program because we felt a calling to lifelong career medical missions and that, with all the changes we faced in the last year, that hasn't changed. We still feel like that's our calling, but that's what we want to get back to. Uh, about dealing with my children and fear. Um, my children were young enough when I was sick. I think they didn't deal with a lot of fear of losing their dad because they didn't comprehend the the severity of it all. Um, we've We've talked with them about the fact that I had Ebola. They know, they our lives were consumed with Ebola before I got sick, before they left West Africa. And so they knew about Ebola. They knew that people were dying. They knew that it was a, a big, dangerous problem around where we lived. And I think we helped them deal with fear by letting them see how we deal with it. You know, I, I think in the midst of change and transition or scary circumstances, children, what children need is not just reassurance for themselves that everything's okay or, or 
tools for dealing with their fear. They need stable, loving adults in their life who they can see are are going to be their source of stability. Mm -hmm. You know, they they had my wife throughout my illness in the earliest days of my illness when when I was still in Africa. They had their mom still there, and they had lots of family members that came around to take care of them in the midst of that chaos and crisis. And they had an aunt and uncle who took care of them for three weeks while I was in the hospital in Atlanta who showed them consistent daily love and, and security. And I think that's what they need to be able to deal with fears, to know that that they are loved and, and cared for and that, that somebody's taking care of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so true. Um, I think we'll close with this one other question uh, that we have. Um, upon being infected with the Ebola yourself, did you ever ask yourself, why did God choose me to be the first American to contract Ebola? And if so, how did you answer that question? Hmm. Um, well, first, let me say I'm not the first American to ever contract Ebola. Uh, I'm the first one who got treated here in this country, I'm the first one on U.S. soil with Ebola, but there have been other Americans in the past. In fact, there was a, a an American missionary doctor who was working in Congo in Zaire in the early 70s, who after Ebola was was discovered in 76 and they were doing surveillance testing of people in that area, he tested positive for antibodies to Ebola, meaning that some mysterious illness he had had in 1972 actually was Ebola virus. Um, so I'm not the first American to have Ebola. That question of why I do wrestle with a lot, except I think my perspective on it is a little different. I What I know what I know is that God is sovereign. What I don't know is exactly what that means. And, and although I am convinced that God is sovereign, that he is in control, that ultimately he will set all things right, that God is who he says he is, and that one day he will set all things right, I don't know what that means on a daily basis basis when it comes to the fact that I contracted Ebola. I don't think, people have asked me, did your faith save, do you think it's your faith that saved you, that brought you through this? It was my faith and my commitment to following Jesus that got me Ebola. It was my faith that put me in a place where I was at risk of this terrible disease. And I have a mentor and Randy Harris is a professor at Abilene Christian University who is quoted as saying, the love of God protects us from absolutely nothing. The love of God protects us from absolutely nothing. That's, that's the question. That, that changes how I wrestle with the question of why. Um, I, I don't think I will ever come up with a satisfactory answer to why. Now, I, I could say, why was I chosen to be the first one to get brought back to America with Ebola? And then I could look at my current circumstances and say, oh, well, maybe it was because God wanted me to be able to have this platform to speak to so many people, to to give him the glory for my life, and to to share this message with a with a broader audience than I ever could have as a missionary doctor in Liberia. And maybe that's true. Maybe that's true. I'm not denying that that could be exactly how this all works. But when you've seen your colleagues die from the same disease, when you've seen 11,294 other people die from this same disease, and many of them were mothers with children. They were fathers. They were providers for their families. They were children. They were faithful Christians 
who prayed earnestly that God would spare their lives, and they had hundreds and thousands of people praying for them. I'll never find a satisfactory answer to why in that setting, because my life is not any more valuable than theirs. But the question I do have to answer every day, whether I want to or not, is, so what now? I am alive. God did spare my life. So how am I going to use my life? And, and I hope that my answer is that I'm going to use it in a meaningful way that is a blessing to other people and that is glorifying to God. And I hope that maybe it may be even just one other person can grasp the reality of that question through my story without having to face a near-death experience themselves. Yeah, what a, what a challenge for us all. Thank you so much again, Dr. Brantley, for being here with us and uh, just for the great presentation. I know I've been challenged and I hope you have uh, been too. We want to thank you to everyone who participated in this for your questions, uh, for watching it.